Now, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, earlier in the chapter, he says, let no man deceive you. See, there again is the, the whole theme of end time prophecy by Jesus in his Olivet Discourse and by Paul in his passages. Let no man deceive you. That's the main theme of the end times, deception. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. There's two, two more of those titles, man of sin, son of perdition. And each one of those has a whole study behind them. We won't take the time here. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. We know he's going to be acceptable to the Jews because Jesus says in John 5, 43, I've come in my Father's name, you receive me, me not. But another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. So we know he's going to be accepted as the Messiah by Israel. We know he's going to be accepted to the pseudo-Christians on the planet Earth because he'll come as a pseudo-Messiah or a Christos or whatever. But I want you to notice, above all that is called God, read that as including Allah. He's going to be accepted by the Muslim world. Now it's very interesting, by the way, if you start studying Shiite eschatology, you discover that they believe that their deliverer, who was born in 940 AD but occulted, disappeared, and will show up again at the end times to help put away the Antichrist, strangely enough, <laughs> um, the 12th Imam, they believe he's around somewhere in Arabia today. Now, I'm not suggesting it's true, I'm saying that's what they believe, and their mindset is being prepared to accept some super guy who's going to step forward in, the, in, in their terms. Somehow, I suspect, he's going to fulfill the expectation of each of the groups. So he will about, uh, exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. That's a lot of stuff. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. And from the grammar here it's clear we're talking about the literal temple in Jerusalem being rebuilt. This is one of the allusions to it. Showing himself that he is God. Shirley MacLaine, move over. <laughs> Coming world leader. 33 titles in the Old Testament, 13 in the New. Is he Jew or Gentile? I'm not going to get into that one. Remember, Revelation 13 tells you it's a duet. There's two beasts in Revelation 13. Where does he come from? We could talk a lot about this guy. I just want to make one real point with two verses. When they shall have finished their testimony, speaking of the two witnesses in Revelation 11, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. This is the first time he's mentioned in the book of Revelation. Where does he come from? Out of the abuso. Is this guy born of a woman? Maybe. But where does he really come from? Is he just some kind of political leader that is somehow empowered? No, I don't think so. I think there's something supernatural in his background. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sawest and was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, or the abuso, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are not written in the book of life. They're going to be amazed at this guy. Hal Lindsey and Dave Hunt both have said from public platforms they believe when the Antichrist shows up that he will probably either be an alien or boast of a very close alien connection. Now the big lie comes in the same passage, 2 Thessalonians 2, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Your English may say a lie, that's a mistranslation. The Greek says there's a, there's a definite article. There is a specific lie they're going to buy into. Now all of us as we study prophecy have problems. There's areas that we just have a tough time visualizing. Let me tell you one I've had trouble with since I was a kid. And that is, there's a number of passages, and I'll use Psalm 2 as an example. Second Psalm is a fascinating Psalm. And by the way, when you get a chance, take a piece of paper and diagram Psalm 2. It's a short Psalm. Three people are talking. Figure out who the three people are, who's saying what to whom. It's a conversation among the Trinity in the Old Testament. One person says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Oh, really? Saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. First three verses. It goes on. 
He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh and hold them in derision in the sore displeasure. It's interesting. This is one of several passages which describe the final climactic event on the, on, before the second coming in which the world, the nations of the world, take up arms against God. That mystifies me. I can understand the world rejecting God. I can visualize the world pretending he's not around. I can visualize the world doing lots of offensive things. I can't imagine in my mind how the world is going to load up weapons and go to war against God. I mean, get serious. There's another place. In Revelation 16 is another one of these passages. This one fascinates me because I always thought this was symbolical somehow. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Whoa, wait a minute. As you read the folklore surrounding the aliens and all these reports, you discover there appears to be three primary types. The greys, the menials that are somehow, the menials, whatever that means. They have the Pleiadians or Nordics, call them what you will, that look like us. You wouldn't presum Presumably they could be among us, you wouldn't recognize them. Then there's this strange group you're hearing more and more about in more recent reports, the reptilians or reptoids, where they're scaly, ugly, weird creatures. And by the way, there are women that report repeat, uh, uh, frequent sex with them. Are they deluded? Who knows? But those are reports. I mean, it's kind of strange. Can't imagine that being... Anyway. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. What are they? For they are the spirits of demons or devils working miracles. And what do they do that for? Which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to do what? To gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. The devils, minions, uh, whatever they are, are organizing the world to go to war against God. Now you say, Chuck, that's kind of strange. And yet, we can begin to imagine at least one plausible scenario. If aliens in some form ultimately make a public involvement on the earth, first of all, that'll throw out Western civilization out the window, including the Judeo-Christian heritage. It'll be a quaint tradition that'll be no longer tenable in worldly terms. And these aliens are here to help us. What are they here to help us to do? Well, if nothing else, to prepare us for the bad guys who are coming. Oh, really? Is it possible that we've got Satan playing good cop, bad cop here? Are, is it possible that we got the good guys trying to help us to go to war against the bad guys, and the bad guys happen to include a guy wearing a, wearing a, I mean, a riding a white horse and, you know, Revelation 19, all that? Okay. I don't know. But for the first time, I can begin to visualize what might be going to go on. Now, here's the challenge. Again, we'll wrap it up. The question I'm going to ask you is, are we being plunged into that period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climb the mountains of Judea. We talked earlier about this linear concept of time. And uh, there are people in the past that are them. There's us in the present, but we're in this linear period of time. From the throne room of the universe being outside time, all of this is perceptible simultaneously. The predicament of the them, the people in the past, Adam and his fallen race, is understood. Our predicament being derivative of theirs is we're still part of that fallen race. And as a result, of course, we have him come down and pay the price for a destiny that there's no way we could earn ourselves. What an interesting summary. How that Jesus Christ in a sense, traveled back through time, not to change history, but to fulfill it, to fulfill our future. We are the beneficiaries of a love story, written in blood on a wooden cross that was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. 
whether it's them or us, we're all covered by the blood of Christ on the condition we accept it, on the condition that you receive it. Now, I usually like to close pointing out, whenever i got a good conservative group, I love to close this way because there are three things God can't do. Now, most of you know me, so this is not a surprise, but and, and when, I need, when I go to a new church, I usually get a gasp here. God can do anything. Well, the Tanakh says three to eight times that he cannot lie. Something God can't do. God cannot lie. How reassuring that is. Allah of the Quran is capricious, untrustworthy. The God of the Old Testament is one who makes and keeps his promises. They're, very, they're opposites in many ways. Second thing he can't do, he can't learn. Why can't he learn? He knows everything. That's wonderful. That's encouraging. Because if he can't learn, that means he can't be disappointed in me. <laughs> Wilbur Smith says it's so cute. See, I'm glad he chose me before the foundation of the world, because if you look at me now, he might change his mind. No. <laughs> when I get uptight, I'm cranky, whatever, and I really blow it. I really lose my cool. And I look back and Oh, did I screw up? I'm shocked at the way I handled that particular situation. I may be shocked. Is he, was he surprised? Hardly. He knew it was coming. That's why he had to die. Third thing he can't do. He can't force you to love him. Love is not an emotion, it's a commitment. I was one evening with an atheistic or agnostic doctor. MD. Nice guy, friendly, but clearly uh, um, you know, not a believer. And he was in a friendly way, but challenging me, you know, about uh, you know, um, is, you know is a variation of the predestination free will issue. You know, is it all predicted, therefore it's all certain, or do I have a choice? Kind of, that kind of a conundrum. And I went into this whole business of the sovereignty. The problem isn't the sovereignty of God. He made the place. He writes the rules. The problem isn't that. The problem is the sovereignty of man. God has given us a gift that's terrifying. It's called free choice. We can choose to love him or not. We either do or don't. It's up to us, not him. It's up to us. And, uh, and I, was just, I was on that kick and I was, I was going down that path and indicated that um, the, the, the fearfulness of that gift that God has given us, our sovereignty. And I got to the point where I said the most, the most, the safest thing to do with that gift, you know what you do with it? You give it right back. You give it right back. And he looked at me and he says, his whole demeanor changed. He says, how do I do that? I don't want to screw that up. I said, we can pray about it right now. And we and some friends that were with us knelt around the coffee table, and he came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That quick. Now, this was not an altar call kind of mood. It was sort of a contentious, apologetic uh, bunch of baloney. And then suddenly, caught me by surprise. His demeanor changed. He wasn't quarreling with the issue. He understood. And he, in his words... Chuck, I don't want to screw this up. How do I do it? I told him how simple it was, and we did dealt with it. And obviously, it's not that simple. It's more follow-up. But the point is, he made his decision to be with the Lord, and that puts the ball in the Lord's court, which is exciting. I used to go around with this little thing, and Lou Phelps, one of the Calvary pastors, said, Chuck, you can add something. There's four things God doesn't know. I says, what? God knows everything. He said, well, try this on. There are four things that God doesn't know. He does not know a sin he doesn't hate. Well, I had to agree. I guess that's right. You know. In fact, we talk about spiritual maturity. How spiritually mature are you? How do you measure maturity? I'll tell you one way. Not the only way, but one way. How much do you hate sin? When you hate sin as the Father does, you're growing to be like... Follow me? Well, the second thing he doesn't know, he does not know a sinner he does not love. We get that backwards. We love the sin and hate the sinner. Oh, not me. How long has it been since you've rented an X or R-rated movie? 
We love violence and things. See, God hates homosexuality, but he loves the homosexual. I have a hard time with that. I mean, I really do. You know, uh, I love, uh, Robert Schuller has this thing, God loves you and so do I. I have a variation of that that I use. God loves you and I'm trying. <laughs> he does not know an alternate path to his throne but through his son. If there's an alternative way for you to be reconciled to the God of the universe, to be able to approach his throne, to have fellowship with him, then Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane was not answered. He, sweat, he prayed so he sweated drops of blood, and that's not a layman's jargon, that was a Dr. Luke that told you that. If there's another path to the throne of God other than through Jesus Christ, he died in vain. He prayed to the Father. If there's any other way, let's take it. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Three times he prayed that. He's the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. He made the place. He writes the rules. Those are the rules. It's God's choice to measure all things throughout the universe in terms of that cross that was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. My apologies to NASA with their life in space. I got a problem with life in space. I want to know, not is there life in space, I want to know is it sinless or sinful? I got a problem either way. If it's sinless, I have a hard time reconciling it with what I think I know. If it's sinful, I got even more problems. Because Jesus died once and for all. There is a fourth thing that God does not know, and I, obviously that's in quotes. He does not know a better time to receive his son than right now. Praise God. Now, I predictably have overrun my time by a quarter of an hour. So we'll tie it off tonight and then have some time for Q&A. I don't think any of us really know what happened in Roswell 50 years ago in the sense of the alien business. There are tens of thousands of reports. And when you strip away the hoaxes and the foolishness, when you strip away the deliberate disinformation, you still are left with a core of reports that are hard to come to terms with. And I think we have yet to discover what really is all going on. Every one of us have perhaps different views. And the more we study, the more those views may be starting to modify. But what we can tell you from the record that is demonstrable and provably uh, extraterrestrial in its origin is that these kinds of things were predicted by Jesus Christ to come upon the earth. And these kinds of things will not simply be some events happening here or there as incidents. They will be orchestrated with a geopolitical agenda, not just in the U.S., but in the entire world. It's very possible that agenda is far more matured than we have any idea. I do believe, for lots of reasons, that in the coming weeks we're going to be seeing a whole series of startling announcements from our own government and elsewhere. NASA has a financial incentive to invent discoveries. I say invent in quotes, I'm not saying they put them out of whole cloth, but to certainly emphasize possibilities of life in space for funding. Clinton did that ploy August, 7th, August 6th of last year. NASA changed their strategy. Up till then, they were very conservative about these kinds of things. But on August 6th, they start fanning this flame. It's part of a deal, I think, with Clinton for the election, what have you. But they also recognize it's a way to get funding. And the next day, on that morning, on, on the south lawn of the White House, Clinton underscored the whole thing. And I, I think you're going to see more. And the contrivance of two Mars missions, one to land at the fourth, on Independence Day, and another one that's doing the mapping and will be watching the, the pyramid, I mean the uh, face and all that business. Uh, you can expect all kinds of things coming. Some of them may be real, some of them may be noise, but we'll see. But I think we're going to be challenged in our Christian faith like we have never been challenged before. And I think the apologetic materials that are generally available to us and to pastors are uh, lacking in dealing with some of these issues. 
I do believe you and I need to study more intensely Genesis 6 to, in order, not just for the historical validity of it, but to understand the prophecies in the Old and New Testament that deal in these terms. I think we need to be prepared for the strangeness. We need to prepare so that, we, that we're ready to give every man an answer of the reason that's, of the hope that's within us. Now, we happen to have in our possession an extraterrestrial message that's been authenticated. And uh, there are two critical discoveries that changed my life. My background is engineering, and uh, I've uh, uh, spent most a 30-year career as a techno high technology executive. The thing that impressed me most during my life is the discovery that the Bible, first of all, is an integrated message even though it's written by, in 66 separate books by 40 different guys who didn't even know each other over a period of almost 2,000 years. It's an integrated message. I'm going to demonstrate that to you in a few moments. So the first point is that there's two discoveries, that it's an integrated message. The second thing we discover is that it has its origin from outside the dimensionality of time itself. And this is going to be very, very relevant because it describes the kinds of experiences that we see coming upon the planet Earth in some very unique ways. And so that's our goal today, to explore that a little bit. Now, God, let me ask a question, is God subject to gravity? I don't think so. So God is not somebody who has lots of time. God is somebody who's outside the dimensionality of time altogether. And that's what Isaiah means when he says, it, Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Now, how does he, if he has the technology to create us in the first place, does he have the technology to get a message to us? Of course. The problem is, how does he authenticate his message? How does he let us know that the message we possess is really from him and not some kind of contrivance or some kind of fraud. How many of you here in the audience believe that this is the word of God? Wonderful, that's the politically correct response <laughs> in this community. Outside, maybe not so, but here, okay. The question you need to ask yourself desperately is how do you know? Because if we're correct, before this day is over, you're going to discover that we're going to be we are being plunged into the greatest cosmic deception that will ever come upon the planet Earth. The lie. The New Testament talks about it. I don't think that's an ism. Mark Eastman and I both believe it's a very tangible, specific thing that we're going to try to cover. And you, as a member of the Christian community, are going to be, in the coming months, coming years, challenged in a way that will require you to really know why you believe this is the Word of God. But let's move on a little bit here. God authenticates it by declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Only God has that capability, not angels, not any other created thing, only God himself. And he demonstrates that this is from him, how? By writing history before it happens. Now, let me talk a little, we've talked a little bit about time. We've talked about multiple spaces, three-dimensional spaces, four-dimensional spaces, we've talked about that. Let's talk about time. You and I think of linear time. We have a tough time even thinking about two-dimensional, three-dimensional time. But let's imagine that this curve through three-dimensional space is a line that represents our timeline. Let's imagine some being is outside our dimensionality of time. And in our uh, dimension of time, we have the past, the present, and the future as we experience it going through this line, right? Now, an analogy here would be like the parade that's going on right now through Roswell. If you're sitting on the curb watching these floats come around the corner, for you on that curb, that parade is a linear sequence of events. But if you are outside the plane of that, of that parade, say in a helicopter above the parade, you can see the beginning at the end at the same instant. That's a clumsy analogy, but I think you get the idea. Now that means that even though for us it's past, present, and future, from someone in eternity who can watch the past, the present, and the future, it's, 
in common, so to speak, for the one in eternity. Now, moving on, the rabbis in Israel have a quaint expression about the Torah or the Tanakh or the Bible as we would think of it. They say, we really won't understand the scripture until the Messiah comes, but when the Messiah comes, he will not only interpret the passages, he'll interpret the very words, the very letters. In fact, he'll even interpret the spaces between the letters. When I first heard that, I smiled because I just regarded it as a colorful exaggeration. Until I reread Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, where Jesus himself says, Think not that I've come to destroy the Torah and the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now a yacht or a tittle in the Hebrew is sort of equivalent. See, a yacht is sort of like our little apostrophe. A tittle is the little decorative hook on certain letters. A yacht or a tittle is sort of like us saying a crossing of the T or the dotting of an I. They're parts of a letter. And Jesus is saying even the parts of a letter will be fulfilled. So this should give us, suddenly I realize these rabbis might be closer to the truth than I had realized. And I want to give you some examples to dramatize this before we continue. I'm going to suggest to you the great discovery in my life, and I hope it'll be in yours, is that in e each book of the Bible is a key part of an integrated message. Every name, every number, every detail, even the numerical structure behind the text is there evidences, skillful design. And as you discover that, you gain a whole different perspective and insight about what the Bible is really all about. Now let me give you a provocative example. When you're reading your book of Genesis, when you get to chapter 5, you tend to skip it. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, and 4 are exciting, meaningful, rich material. Chapter 6 on is the flood and all that business. And we're going to talk about that very meaningfully here in a little bit. But chapter 5 although it's a chapter you tend to skip, has something interesting. Bear with me, I want to show you something. In, chapter 5 is basically a genealogy of 10 guys, from Adam to Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. 10 guys, it's just a genealogy, father, son, and their ages and stuff, and you read through that, and you sort of say to yourself, what's that got to do with anything? Now you remember, gee, Chuck Bissler in one of these weird conferences said that everything in there is by design. Well, let's challenge that a little bit. See, our problem here is these are transliterated, not translated, from the Hebrew. And they're proper names. A Strong's Concordance or some of your other usual helps do not deal with proper names. You have to have a root dictionary and, and have some uh, deeper types of tools to engage this. Let's take a look at what these names mean. Adam is pretty easy. Adamat means man. Seth means appointed. We know that we can glean this from Genesis 4.25. When Eve gave birth to Seth, she felt he was appointed to be a replacement for Abel whom Cain slew. It says so in verse 25 of chapter 4, previous chapter. The, word, the root Seth, for that, the word Seth comes from, uh, implies appointed. Enosh is his son, which it's a word that it comes from the root Anash, which means incurable. It's used of a wound or... Uh, grief, woe, sickness, or wickedness, what have you. It means, it, it actually means mortal, frail, or miserable. Tough handle to go through school with, I imagine. <laughs> now, Kenan is mistranslated in some of your Bibles because it's assumed, a uh, Bible translated assumed it was in Aramaic, would call it Kenan. No, it's Kenan. In fact, uh, Balaam makes a pun on the name in Numbers 24. Kenan means sorrow or dirge or elegy, is what the name means. Mahalalel, kind of a mouthful, but a neat name. It, uh, it comes from two parts. Mahalal, which means the blessed or praise. And the second part is El, the name for God. Mahalalel means the blessed God. There's one way to render that, uh, that uh, inference. Yared is a verb from Yared, meaning shall come down. In fact, some scholars assume that in his days is when the intrusion of the strange things of Genesis 6 began. But that's conjecture. His son is Enoch, which means commencement or teaching. Now, Methuselah is a very, very interesting name, often misunderstood by many commentators, but it comes from two roots. 
The word muth, it, it's a root that means death. It occurs 125 times in the Old Testament. And the verb shalak, which means to bring or send forth. Methuselah actually means his death shall bring. Now what may surprise you is the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. It had been preached on for four generations. Enoch, his father, apparently had a vision that as long as his newly born son was alive, the flood, the judgment flood, would be withheld. And he names him, his death shall bring. Now, if we go through and study the genealogies, you'll discover the year that Methuselah dies is the year the flood came. The prophecy was fulfilled. Interesting prophecy. Can you imagine raising that kid? Every time he caught a cold, I imagine the whole neighborhood went in the panic. <laughs> His son is named Lamech, and here the root is a root we still use today. It comes from a root in our, it was in our English word, lament or lamentation. It really means despairing. And his son is Noah. How many of you have heard of Noah? We've got about 70%, Jim. I think we've got a real problem here. Okay. No, I'm kidding. But we've heard the name Noah. What does the name mean? It is derived from Nacham, which means to bring relief or comfort. Comfort or rest. And you can get this from verse 29 of chapter 5, because when Lamech names me, he indicates that. So these are, these are pretty, uh, most of them are pretty well documented. Some of them take a little digging. Now, um, yeah, see, at verse 29, it says, He called his name Noah, saying, The same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands, because the ground of the Lord hath cursed. So their term comfort, nacham, is, is the root from which the word Noah comes from. So now, with this little bit of background, let's put it together. We look at Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. But now let's put together what we've learned. What does this genealogy say in English? Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah is right. You know, I love to do this because every time, I do this a lot in different audiences, there's always a gasp. <laughs> always a gasp. Now this is interesting for several reasons because here we have a good summary of the Christian gospel, but it's tucked away in a genealogy in the book of Genesis, which is part of the Torah. There's no way you will ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide the Christian gospel in a genealogy in their venerated Torah. No way. The fingerprints of the Holy Spirit are all over this thing. And the reason I like to use this as an example, and there's hundreds I could choose, but this is a simple one, because it demonstrates, among other things, the integrity of design. When you study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and take it seriously, you'll discover it all ties together. If you study the book of Revelation, you discover it's all in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in the scripture, and when you go through it properly, it takes you into every book in the Bible, and you realize the whole thing is a pre-planned package. Even though 40 different guys penned it over thousands of years, and uh, so on. So, let's move on. Now, by the way, how does this all climax? Let's get back to this little model of our timeline. We're in that little linear time, and there's the throne in the throne room of the universe. On this timeline, there are the people of the past. I'll call them them. And there's us in the present. From the throne room of the universe, they could look down and see the dilemma, the predicament that they of the past got themselves into. And we are their offspring. So one came down to fulfill their requirements, to give them a destiny that was so fantastic they could not earn it for themselves. And we are the same beneficiaries of that. This is an example where someone traveled through time, entered our time, not to alter time, but to fulfill the future, our future. And how was this done? By a love letter written in blood on a wooden cross that was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. A pivot point that the entire universe will be measured by. The conflicts 
that are going to be coming upon our earth have already been precast by this event. And we'll see this all unfold here as we go forward. Now, by the way, there's some other implications of this, just to keep you off balance. If that's heaven and this is time, and A is someone that died a thousand years ago and went to heaven, no problem. B is somebody that died last week, that died and went to heaven. And C are people who are raptured, say, a week from Tuesday. <laughs> they all could arrive at heaven at the same instant. So I just mentioned that. Some of you have theological problems about GR, soul sleep and all these other heresies. There is another end run on that. And I'm not suggesting this is necessarily correct. I'm just trying to stretch your imagination relative to these dimensionalities we're talking about. Now I want to give you one other example about the scripture, because I can squeeze it into the time that I've got. Again, I, I want to build in the next hour on this text, but I want you to have a respect for this text that may go far beyond anything you've perceived so far. I want you to imagine, I'm going to give you an assignment. Imagine, you don't literally do this, but imagine taking a piece of paper, and I want you to design a genealogy, and you're entitled, not a real one, do it from your imagination, like a piece of fiction. But I want the number of words in your genealogy to be divisible by seven exactly. You can have seven words, 14, 21, but if you divide the number of words you're using by seven, you have no remainder. You understand what I'm saying? How many could do that? Can I see a show of hands? Sure, okay, good number. I'd like the number of letters also to be divisible by seven exactly. That makes it a little messier, right? How many think you can still do that? Okay, I got a few hands. Let me go on. I want the number of vowels to be divisible by seven exactly, and I'd like the number of consonants to be divisible by seven exactly. How many could do that? Getting a little tougher? Okay. Yes, I'll let you use a computer, sure. The number of words that begin with a vowel should be divisible by seven exactly. The number of words that begin with a consonant should be divis divisible by seven exactly. Okay, the number of words that occur more than once should be divisible by seven. Getting a little tougher? I won't ask for a show of hands. I think some of you are losing art in this assignment. <laughs> the number of words that occur in more than one form divisible by seven, exactly. The number of words that occur in only one form divisible by seven, exactly. How many are still with me? Don't leave, wait, just hang on. Number of nouns that should be divisible by seven. The number, and only seven words shall not be nouns. The number of names shall be divisible by seven and only seven other kinds of nouns will be permitted. This, is the shoe beginning to pinch here a little bit? <laughs> the number of male names shall be divisible by seven. The number of generations shall be divisible by seven. And obviously some of you have guessed that this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter one, first 11 verses. Oh, Praise God. And obviously what I'm drawing upon here are the studies of Ivan Penin, who was born in 1855 in Russia, thrown out because of plots against the Tsar and other things, and he, went, and he ultimately goes to Harvard, and uh, graduates in mathematics, becomes a Christian, discovers certain things about the scripture, spent 50 years of his life obsessed with what he's discovering, so he left 43,000 pages of little tiny handwritten notes of discoveries that he made. Let me give you another one that's not as well known, but is even more profound in my view. The heptatic structure of the biblical text, that is its sevens, not just in numbers of the narrative, but in the textual structure of it, is something that's been well known for years, although he, discovered, he took it a lot further. Pannon discovered that the vocabulary that's unique to the Gospel of Matthew is also divisible by seven, and in both the words and the letters. In other words, there's uh, 42 words that occur in Matthew and nowhere else in the New Testament, that's seven times six, and there are 126 letters in that vocabulary, which is seven times 18. Now let's just ask yourself, okay, it's kind of a strange characteristic, but wait a minute, how, assuming that was your goal, how could you organize that to happen? There's only two ways you could do that. One is you have to sit down with all the other writers of the New Testament and get them to agree not to use those seven words, those uh, uh, 42 words. Follow me? Or, since that's not feasible, 
You could wait until they've all written their stuff and then you write yours. So the unique vocabulary implies that Matthew was written last, right? So that's no problem. Gospel of Matthew has a unique vocabulary divisible by seven exactly. So it would seem to indicate that Matthew was written last, except the Gospel of Mark has the same thing. Words that are unique to Mark and another book in the New Testament have a vocabulary that's divisible by seven exactly. And so does the Gospel of Luke. So does the Gospel of John. And so do the writings of James, Peter, Jude, and Paul, which proves each one was written last. <laughs> Not a big thing except, except there are fingerprints all over this thing of the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to go to Bible codes and some of these other sort of speculative areas to come back with an awe and a respect for the Bible as it sits in your lamp. Now, there are many certainties that Peter, for an example, had, because he was an eyewitness to Jesus' miracles and so forth, but Jesus, Peter says something else in 2 Peter 1.19. He says we, that are eyewitnesses, we also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed as the light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and that day star arise in your hearts. I'm not talking about a UFO here, we'll get to that later. Um, the more sure word of prophecy, one of the things that is irrefutable is the degree to which the Bible writes history in advance. Now, by the way, there's no other holy book on the planet Earth that can validly make that claim. There's no prophecy in the Quran. There's no pro prophecy in the Veda or the Bhagavad Gita. There are in the Hindu writings. The Book of Mormon, no prophecy, no valid prophecy. Nostradamus, despite the claims that are made, if you investigate it, they're ambiguous and uh, those are contrived. The occultic mediums, the channelers, the New Age spirit guides. You make your list, nobody has a perfect 2020 error-free track record of predicting the future but one book, the one you've got in your lap. A tremendous, critical foundation to our perspectives. Now, what does this book tell us? It tells us, first of all, that we are in possession of a message of extraterrestrial origin. So it should not surprise us to find out that UFOs and such are in here, which is the primary subject of our gathering today. The book also portrays us as objects of an unseen warfare. Boy, we better find out what's going on and what the agenda is. Our eternal destiny depends upon our relationship with the winner of this cosmic conflict. And it's becoming, it's not new, but it's becoming increasingly visible. And I believe if our perspective is correct, it's going to come to its climax during our lifetime. Fashion your seatbelts. The question that you have to answer for yourselves before the day is over <laughs> is, what is your readiness for this encounter? And by the way, just being a sincere Christian in a vital fellowship of some kind ain't enough. I uh, made the remark in some previous uh, broadcasts that a Christian cannot be abducted. And I got a call from a top executive at Universal Studios, so to speak freely, I won't mention his name, um, but he called me, he says, Chuck, I heard your thing on the radio and you're right on target. I'm very expert in this area because I was involved in a number of major projects. Uh, in this area. I've sat in the sessions with John Mack and Bud Hopkins and so forth and I have to tell you, I had to track you down and call you because you're wrong. Christians can be abducted. I was so startled by the call, I, I didn't press him for more details, although he did indicate that I should investigate the Andreessen affair. And the Andreessen affair is one of these situations where apparently a very, very active Christian gal and a very, very excellent, presumably, you know, spirit-filled fellowship, uh, was abducted. But if you read the record carefully, they invited her and she agreed to go. So I'm going to amend my, my conjecture that a Christian cannot be abducted against their will. And one of the things you want to deal with today is, and I have no idea which reports are valid of all the tens of thousands of reports of UFOs and encounters. 
as you'll discover that, uh, well, we'll get to the abduction thing here in a little bit, but you want, just because you have a Bible in your lap and you're sincere in your Christian faith, doesn't mean you've done your homework. Paul instructs you to put on the armor of God. That's an imperative. In order to do that, you better know what it is. And he says the whole armor, not just your favorite parts. So we need to deal with that. Here's our challenge. It's my conjecture that you and I, it's my belief that you and I, are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Now, if you accept that statement, you flunk the course, because what I want you to do is challenge it. But I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time, including the time that Jesus ministered here on the planet Earth. And the question is, why do I believe that? There are major prophetic themes about the end times. If you want to know what time it is on God's clock, you always look at the nation Israel. Predicted to be regathered, they are, and I won't start on that one. We'd be here all day on just that subject. City of Jerusalem, much the same about city of Jerusalem. The more you know about the passage, the more you know what's going on in the diplomatic circles, the more you see it, Zechariah 12 starting to happen. The temple, we know the temple is going to be rebuilt because Jesus, Paul, and John all make reference to it as standing at the second coming. Why do we know it's going to be built? Because they all say so. What's exciting is they're getting ready to do that. Several hundred young guys in training and so forth. You know the story. City of Babylon has to rise to power in order to receive the judgment that has never happened, that both Jeremiah and Isaiah detail. Saddam Hussein has begun, spent over a billion dollars in 25 years rebuilding the city of Babylon. It is a long way to go, but it has started before our very noses. Russia, Magog, the more you know about Ezekiel 38 and 39 in terms of the technicalities of that passage, and the more you're up to date on the current intelligence picture in the Middle East, the more it would seem I'm not saying it will, but the more it seems that it could happen at any day now. And by the way, any of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I encourage you to take advantage of our free offer. Anyone at this conference that doesn't know, uh, get our intelligence newsletter can, by simply giving their, us their name and address, there'll be sign-up sheets in the back. If you're watching by uh, internet or whatever, you can do it on the internet. If you're listening by phone or on a tape, you can call us at 1-800-K-HOUSE-1, leave your name and address. Ask for the year subscription to our intelligence newsletter, and we'll give you a, not a sample issue, a full year of a 32-page monthly publication that attempts to highlight the biblical relevance of current events, and uh, in the hopes that you will find it addictive, of course. I hope you renew when the year's up. The rise of China, much talked about in the scripture, and certainly a major event of the coming decade. The decline of the U.S., implied by many things, and of course, another subject that there's much we could talk about. While all this is going on, the rise of the European superstate, and we're going to talk a little bit about this more today. While all this is going on, religion is being championed throughout the world to become ecumenical. We'll talk a little bit about that. And obviously, we're there's a move to a global government for lots of reasons. Perhaps the primary forcing function is nuclear proliferation. That's understandable. But there's another forcing function that might be the UFOs. I'll come back to that before we're through. The rise of the occult in our society, most of us that grew up in the 50s or 60s or whatever, the big issue on the college campuses is it was rationalism versus theism. Not today. Both sides of the debates accept the supernatural, the question who's going to win. Different kind of debate on the campuses today. And of course, the other prophetic thing, and it may surprise you to discover that UFOs are one of the major prophetic themes in the scripture. Now, Jesus gave us a very, very strange warning. Jesus said in Matthew 24, that famous exposition of his confidential briefing to his disciples, he said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And I suspect there's not one Christian in a hundred that knows what that means, because they have been mistaught about the days of Noah. Most of us, unless we've done some unusual homework, have no idea what the days of Noah were really like. The question isn't the flood of Noah. There's plenty of scientific evidence that indicates that happened. The question is why? Why did God send a flood and decide to, to wipe out all life upon the earth except for nine people? You mean eight people? No, I mean nine people. Enoch was pulled out beforehand, right? his dad. 
But Noah and his three sons and their four wives are preserved through this ark business, right? The flood isn't the mystery. Why would God resort to that extreme measure? And I've studied this through my 40 years of biblical study as a curiosity and just an interest in the text. It's only recently it hit me between the eyes that unless you understand that, you will not understand the rest of the Old Testament. You will not really understand the prophecies of both the Old and the New. So the question that you and I are going to explore in the coming hour is what does that mean? What were the days of Noah and how does it relate to UFOs and aliens and all that stuff.